On today's download, we'll look at the five things that you need to create impactful brand video, learn how Getty Images delivers video that connects with your audience, and check out our visual GPS research into choosing imagery that reflects the LGBTQ plus community. The download starts now. Hello and welcome to The Download, your insider's guide into the world of visual storytelling. I'm your host, Rachel Brinton Matthews, Senior Art Director here at Getty Images. Thank you for joining us as we take a look at the topics that affect the images and video you choose for your projects. We'll be taking questions at the end of the show, so if you'd like to contribute, please do use the Q&A function below. First up, we have a very special guest, Blair Bursey, Vice President and Director Creative of PR agency Golan. Blair's here to share her expertise into creating impactful standout brand video. Over to you, Blair. Thank you so much, Rachel. I'm so excited to be here and this is going to be fun and get your eyeballs ready because there's gonna be some video examples. So we're gonna start with five elements to creating an impactful brand video. And so the first one I'm gonna give you Tip number one is a laser focused customer aesthetic. So when there's no physical product and there's nothing to kind of focus on, focus on who you're speaking to, who you're providing your service to, who spends their time, and their money with you. What do they look like? Where do they come from? Your media should reflect that in this digital age, people are kind of tired. The fatigue of seeing the glossy, perfect people has gone through. So now we're looking for images that reflect the audience that you're speaking to. So I'm gonna show you some examples. Um, so if you're in fitness, try not to find the kind of perfect glossy toned bodybuilder, but more kind of your example of what fitness looks like for your customer. Um, if you're in finance, perhaps you don't wanna show the CEO in the office. You wanna show a mother doing her bills at home or you know a young couple looking to buy their first home. So show real people doing relatable things um, and that will make your content stand out within each platform. And then there's a pro tip, search descriptors your team uses internally. I find that once people see that search bar, it's a lot like Google. They put in things that they assume the search should show. So we're going to flip that. You're going to start looking for the terms that you use internally with your team. Getty Images has a really robust library. So when you're searching for footage, use the terms that you use internally and you'll kind of have a more laser focused and pinpoint aesthetic when you find your footage. On to tip number two, refine your creative to fit your resources. So everybody began this pivot to video, but nobody really thought about the budget that it takes to create content. So start th thinking about the, the resources that you have on hand. Start thinking about, you know, if your company can't afford the gear and the man hours and what it would take to churn out production regularly, go start culling through uh, creative imagery, creative video content, and find ways to plus up your communication. Figure out, you know, if you're looking for something for the holiday season, begin to pull in that imagery now. Start finding things that you like, saving them, keeping them on hand so that when you have time to create that content, you know exactly what you have in stock and what you have kind of in your folders. I'm gonna show you some examples. We all talk about working from home. Dogs are a really big part of that. So I know that this is something that a lot of the brands that we work with look for things that are really relatable things that are beautiful and still show your company in a gorgeous light but things that you probably could not afford to produce on your own for various reasons tip number three platform awareness customize your content for the spaces where your audience will be watching so i think when most people think about footage or creating something they think about it in a 16 by nine perspective, so in that good landscape view. But if you're uploading something for Instagram stories, it's gonna be in vertical. So rather than having to crop and lose some of that good real estate on either side, think about maybe creating something within that vertical format or something more square for your Instagram feed, a reaction GIF 
for uh, Facebook or a prompt, a question prompt for Twitter. Create specific either edits or kind of videos that promote engagement on social. Definitely use just as a reaction. Add video for a static image. I know a lot of times, especially for holidays, uh, a lot of brands will post a question or a comment or just you know a good tidings. But you can also create that within video. So think about ways to kind of add a little motion, a little excitement to what you're doing, and join the conversation and meet your consumer, or your, sorry, join the conversation and meet your customer where they are. If they're having conversations on Facebook and they're celebrating kind of those odd holidays like Donut Day or, you know, bring your puppy to work day, hop in there. You don't need to create the content on your own. You can find really beautiful footage and become part of the conversation that they're already having on your social platforms and within your accounts. Here are a few examples. That good realistic video, everybody loves the donut. Also pulling images or reactions. So if you're very excited about something, you know, there's a great way to kind of share that excitement from a brand perspective. And when in doubt, animal photos are a big win. They are a conversation neutralizer. So if things are getting a little too heavy, throw up a very cute animal photos. Dogs will be kind of the winner online and cats as well. But it's one of those things that you should always have in your portfolio and your library just know that a good, beautiful animal photo will always be a great kind of mood elevator and a conversation neutralizer. All right, tip number four, give your audience rich tactile moments. There are universal moments that everybody can see, hear, feel, and touch. Uh, one of the examples I'm gonna show you later is somebody kind of browsing clothes um, on a rack. Everybody knows the sounds, whether they're plastic hangers, wire hangers, wooden hangers. They know the feeling of being in a shop and kind of running their hands along clothing. That's an example that I love to use because it's universal, it's, it's global. Everybody knows that. So give your audience those moments so that they have a connection to your brand. Um, with everybody this past year, with everybody kind of socially distancing and being home, people didn't realize how much human contact and human experience was necessary for them. So Wanderlust was through the roof. So feel free to satiate this need by giving people the opportunity to feel like they're interacting or going outside or traveling within their footage. Drone footage became hugely popular again. So find a piece of drone footage that kind of evokes the feel from a specific region or think about seasonal aspects of your business. Um, kind of give, give your customer a mental vacation if necessary. So I'm gonna show you a few examples. Um, touch and travel has been huge. So go through and try to find you know content that would speak to your audience in a organic way, but also has these elements because the tactile moments will always provide not only positive interaction, but kind of give your content those legs, people come back to it, people share it, and that's exactly what you want. And here's a bonus tip. Zoom footage, um, I think over the past year more than ever, everybody has gotten used to seeing those Brady Bunch boxes within a conversation. If you are recording Zoom footage and you find that it's important or you know you really think that this conversation should be promoted across social platforms or even internally, um, I know we get this a lot, a lot of questions on how to kind of make internal video more engaging add in footage within that Zoom. Let your Zoom become the talk track and pull in gorgeous footage. It not only shows that you cared enough to kind of plus up uh, the communication, but it engages. So even if you were part of the Zoom or you've heard the topic before, seeing that rich footage laid over kind of the impactful or important topics will increase kind of the positive feedback and the positive sentiment when people are watching footage that could just be you know, a standard recorded Zoom call. And number five, make sure that your brand video doesn't feel like a brand video. Every platform has the ability to run ads. So if you're gonna run an ad, run an ad. But if you want a brand video that is either gonna give you earned or an earned opportunity, or you know, you wanna give back to your audience in some way or your customers in some way, give them something. Your video should be so engaging and so wonderful and have kind of such a purpose that even if you took your brand out of it, people would still want to watch and interact with it. So think about useful and compelling content 
then integrate your brand message. It might be a gentle touch. Think about other ways that, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be a logo in a corner. It can be your brand aesthetic, your themes, your colors, uh, maybe a, use a prop. Uh, there are lots of different ways that you can make a connection between your brand and what your audience needs or what they would find engaging. Um, and I think a lot of people are figuring out what their consumers are into kind of in a creative and hobby DIY sort of way. So think about that. If knitting or pottery or planting um, is something that you find being talked about within your audience or something that you'd like your audience to kind of focus on, create a video with that in mind. The term branded content has a rainbow of opportunities. So don't think of it as a kind of QVC infomercial. Um, think of it as kind of a way to boost brand awareness and give back um, and you'll be seen a lot more favorably with your audience. And that has been my presentation. Thank you so much. Rachel, I'm gonna throw it back to you. Thank you so much, Blair, for that fantastic presentation. Loads of brilliant insight there. Back after this. I'm now joined by Blair Bercy, as well as my colleagues, Alwyn Gosford and Amy Leffelt, both senior art directors here at Getty Images. So Blair just walked us through the five things we need in order to create impactful brand video. They were a laser focused consumer aesthetic, creative that matches your resource, having a platform awareness, finding those rich and tactile moments and a gentle but considered and creative way to bring in brand awareness. Amy, what are some of the things that you think about and talk about with your video creators when approaching authenticity? Um, I talk to contributors a lot about finding unique stories. So by doing that, they're gonna find interesting people and that way they've got a truly authentic starting point to work with. For example, we're continually uh, working on adding to our disrupt aging collection. So I'll do a, I'll do research on the internet and try to find seniors living in an interesting way or maybe having a special interest that makes for a good narrative. For instance, I found a group of senior women who were synchronized swimmers and worked with a contributor to film them. So I really try to push highlighting less predictable stories and unexpected main characters within them because that's what gets me excited and it also gets our contributors excited to shoot. Thank you. Alwyn, what about you? Is there anything you'd add there? I always like to try and put um, diversity within a broader context. So when I'm talking with contributors, I try and get them to think about what unites us rather than what sets us apart. So for instance, at the moment, I'm working on a shoot and we've gathered a really diverse cast of people together. But what we're doing is we're taking them into a furniture store. So we're going to get them to buy sofas and tables and chairs and lamps and everything, because it doesn't matter whether you're, you know, what your age or race, religion or sexual orientation is, everyone buys furniture. That's what unites us. Absolutely. We also heard a bit about platform awareness, and this is something we're definitely very conscious of too at Getty Images when we're developing our shoots. We have to think about the intended audience and the context of the video. Amy, I was wondering what sort of insights you have here and what you talk about with your contributors ahead of shoots when thinking about formats and platforms. Yeah, I think a lot about how everyone lives on their phones. So the mobile uh, format is really important and social media lends itself to vertical video, as Blair said. So we specifically brief for that platform now. We're used to mobile being more immersive. So the content has to have that um, particular look and feel. 
So what's going to read on a device versus the big screen is completely different. So we need to approach it differently, maybe by um, focusing on points of view or framing tighter shots, for example. Yeah, everything is in the mobile now. Blair, you spoke a bit about um, the heavy lifting of production, but also the value add of video. Just wondering what challenges it is that you experience with respect to that when making uh, branded content. I think going into everything, you know, assuming that people understand the cost of production and, you know, getting kind of the exact idea accomplished within video is hard. So I think that's probably the biggest awakening when I go through a brief and when I sit down with somebody and kind of assess what they need. Um, that seems to be it, which is why, once again, I rely so heavily on beautiful commercial footage. And I look forward to getting not only that shopping footage, Alwyn, but I also would like some synchronized swimming footage to implement. So thank you guys for creating such gorgeous content consistently. You're getting a great inside track into the wonderful creative collection that we have. Alwyn, you work on or have worked on a lot of high production value shoots uh, over the years at Getty Images, ones that probably have an expense that uh, most of us can't even think about. Um, can you tell us a bit more about these shoots, particularly because I, I doubt many people know that they uh, exist in library footage? Yes, that's right. Um, we have a list of tough to get subjects um, that often hang around for you know, a year or two years. And so we look at that um, subject list and we look at the demand, the likely demand for those subjects. And then given that demand, can we produce a shoot that is of the level that the customer wants? And then can we get that shoot to pay back in a reasonable amount of time? And if the answer is yes, then we'll, we'll go ahead and, um, and have a go at doing that subject. And that's how I ended up doing um, a year or so ago, um, international football shoot. Because obviously at that level, football is governed by various, um, various bodies. And so if you want to use real game footage um, of, of, the, of a soccer or um, a football match, depending on which country you're in, you've got to go through them. And it's very time consuming to negotiate and also very, very expensive. So when we were looking at that project, we thought, well, if we can produce something that is ready to go, um, immediately usable and, and restriction free, then that will be, you know, something amazing for customers. So we decided to tackle that project. And from that point on, really, it's just a series of problem solving exercises, really. So can we find two professional teams? Can we find a stadium that looks good enough? Uh, can we get two uniforms made bespoke so they're completely different? Uh, and then can we put um, all those things that you see around a match on match day, the marshals, the photographers, that kind of thing. And um, when we've solved all that problem, then we're ready to shoot. Um, in our case, that took 11 months of work to get to that point. But, you know, we did it and um, we got a really good product and then we, we got something that's super high value, um, really, really valuable to customers and um, is unique, you know, in the library world. Yeah, they're amazing shoots. And I, I've been lucky to see the kind of pre-production that goes into it and all the production for the day. And it is, it's like a mathematical equation. Um, so very, very impressive. The, there's something inherently visceral about video and it's why it is so engaging, but it's not always easy to achieve this, uh, both in subject matter, but also kind of the aesthetic. I'm wondering what insights both Alwyn and Amy share, what you share with your video creators to kind of help them achieve this this look? To create something that feels very real in video, there's so many um, more choices and decisions in the pre-planning that need to come together um, more than stills. So you just can't wing it. You need a fuller narrative. You need the cast to be really immersed in um, the situation or familiar with the story. And the right location and the time of day um, are really important, even the weather, because that's going to set um, the tone and the mood. You also need to think about cameras and lenses. Um, do you want a wide view or do you want to isolate the subject? Do you want to use handheld um, because it's going to add a lot of realism and grittiness to it? Or do you want more of a smooth, polished kind of feel? And then you've got to think about um, how your actors are going to move, uh, how your camera is going to move. Are you going to rack focus or are you going to uh, follow them or lead them? 
Um, and then you move on to lighting. Are you going to use um, the light, the ambient light? Um, so the choices and details uh, go on and on to create an atmosphere and a tone and an energy that uh, feels real. I think what um, Amy said is uh, is completely right. And the only thing I would add on top of that would be um, is camera work. Camera work is the body language of any any piece of video, and you can't just pick up a camera and be brilliant at it. It's a skill that you develop over you know over months and years. And it's having that sixth sense of when to move the camera and how to move the camera. Are you making motivated camera moves? Are you following the energy of the scene? Those kinds of things. And then on top of that, you've got coverage, which is shooting the scene from different angles and different shot sizes, which we would do to give the customer the, the most choice uh, when they're coming to put their edit together, because we never know what the pace of the edit's going to be. Is it going to be cut really slow? Is it going to come really fast? And so that determines how much material the customer wants. Absolutely. And just a final question, I wanted to shoot one to Blair. What were your thoughts on hearing all of that insider knowledge now of what everything goes into the, the wonderful footage that you find on gettyimages.com? Well, I have a shopping list now. I know exactly what I'm looking for. I greatly appreciate, I don't know if you guys hear this, but I appreciate the big budget shoots. I work with a team that also films a lot, but there are things that we would never be able to do and or even license. And footage, football or soccer footage, uh, depending on where you are, it, it's just one of those things that we historically have never been able to really been to be able to implement simply because the process of getting it cleared is very, very, very long. And then it's extremely expensive. So I really appreciate kind of that attention to detail. And I wasn't aware that all of that was available. So I'm excited to kind of dig in. I can't wait. Thank you, guys. Amazing. Thank you very much to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. This segment was brought to you by Getty Images Premium Access. Getting the world's best imagery is easier than you might think. With Premium Access, your whole team can harness our world-moving imagery and full creative collection. From images to video, illustration, music and more. All in one place, royalty-free and ready for your project. Need editorial content? We've got that covered too. Speak to your Getty Images sales representative or customer support via gettyimages.com. Next up, the fastest five minutes in search. Welcome back to the show, Blair Bercy, and also from our Getty Images North America research team, Daniel Montoya. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Blair. Hello. Hi, Rachel. Um, yeah, as you said, um, I am part of the North America research team. Um, we have offices in New York, Chicago, and I'm in the Los Angeles office. And um, I work with clients all over the world um, to help them find the perfect video for their campaign. And so I'm very familiar with how to search the website and find um, what you need a little quicker. So Blair, uh, thanks for, jo for joining me. Let's say that you're my client. Um, what is something that a type of video that you've been looking for lately? I'm gonna make this time work for all of us. I'm gonna give you something that I actually need to find. So with everybody returning to the office, it's just not feasible for me to send a crew to everyone's office and see what it looks like. And I think a lot of companies are looking for ways to boost millennial morale and just kind of showing them that everyone's happy to be back together again. So I'm looking for office footage that reflects current kind of millennials in the office. Do you have something for me? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, let's um, let me get started and I'll share my screen. Let's go ahead and as you can see here, we're on the landing page of Getty. But before I show you the three tips, um, I wanted to let you know that number one, I'm logged in. And number two, I have two windows open and I'll tell you why. On the second window, I'll go ahead and I'll create a board on the top right. And I'm going to label this the five minutes of search. And the reason I'm creating this board now is that way when I'm adding assets on my other tab, I can kind of look to see where I'm at creatively. Uh, maybe I have too many close up shots, maybe I have too many pulled back shots. Um, that way I can kind of give you a good uh, variety. Um, okay, let's get into the three items I'll be showing you today. The first one is Boolean. 
Um, so that means using the term not uh, to filter out what you don't need because it's really easy um, or it's easier to know what you don't need um, versus what you're exactly looking for sometimes. Um, so let's go ahead and search uh, woman office. On the, on the right here, you'll see my little carrot is on creative video. And the first thing you see here is that we have over 250,000 assets, and that's just way too many to look through. Um, so let's scroll down to filters for location, because earlier, I remember you said that it's really important to be in the geographical location of you know where your campaign is running. So let's say for this example, let's be, let's set it for USA. So automatically that takes it down to 23,000 assets. So, you know, it's a little bit more manageable. Now, as we scroll down and look, you see there are, there are people wearing masks and, um, you know, everybody's return to office um, strategy looks a little different. So some people will continue working from home. Others will be able to go back to work in an office setting. Um, but to give you a little bit more options, um, let's just, you know, be mindful of how everybody's going to return to work. Um, we can include the mask, but for this, let's say um, not mask. Um, so this is a Boolean term not. So let's filter that out. So if we scroll down, you can see it removed some of those. It should remove most of them. So let's say um, you like this, um, you like this. And say you also like um, this. Uh, but I want you to focus here. You still see, you know, now there's groups of people. Um, so going back to everybody's um, back to work strategy is a little different. You know, let's just say, let's filter out groups of people too. So let's say not group. And that brought me down to 15,000 assets. Um, so if we scroll down, we should not see as many people in groups, you know, just to be mindful if somebody, uh, if you're working on a spot and they want to, you know, show back to the office, but you know, it's not going to be like it was before for some time. So let's keep going down and adding what some images that you like, clips that you like. Okay, let's go here. Let's go here. Okay, now this is where my other uh, tab comes into place. Let's say we kind of uh, filled every box that we need. Now, if we look on the tab on the top left, let's go to our board. So if I'll go ahead and I'll refresh that, and you'll see all of my assets are here. That's so from here, you can go ahead yeah, you can go ahead and say like, you know what, I have too many of the same uh, perspective, let's change it up. Um, so to recap, we go back here, using the term not will help you filter out what you don't need. And you know what's great is you can actually just continue building this string. So if you wanna say not group, um, not indoors or not on, you know, not on the phone, not on phone, you know, just get creative and uh, until you find what you need. Um, so secondly, let's go back to our board. And the second tip I'm gonna show you is keywords. So say um, you like this shot, go ahead and click on this. And if we scroll down, say you're running out of inspiration for keywords, you're like, you know what, I really like this shot, um, but I'm not sure um, you know, what else I can, I can add to my search string. Let's scroll down to the keyword section. And here is where you will find all the keywords that are attached to that asset. Um, so let's say millennial generation, which you had just mm -hmm. brought up. Um, so let's go back to my search and I'll scroll all the way up. Um, for this example, um, I'll remove the location filter and I'll say, let's put millennial generation and you're going to want to put it in quotes. That way it could be locked together as one search term. So millennial generation will search in one rather than searching for millennial and uh, generation. So let's go ahead and click enter. And now we're down to 9,000 assets. And remember we started at 256. So this is, this is great. So you'll scroll down 
add more clips that work here for you. Some office, some at home. I and if you one. click this one, yeah, it's a, it's a great portrait. So that's another way, you know, and each asset, if you scroll to the bottom, will have its corresponding keywords. So you can go and um, look through these that you like and find what other um, keywords will inspire your, your search. Okay, uh, one last thing before um, I show you all of the assets. So I'll go back to my tab where my board is, my five minutes of search. And let's say I scroll down and um, I really like this one at the bottom. Or actually, let's go with this one. So it's two people. Um, looks like it's a small office, mindful of um, COVID and what, what different um, protocols um, everybody has to adhere by. So let's say you like this and um, you're like, you know, I really like this shot. I like the models. I liked um, the camera movement, but I need more than one asset for my spot. So if you click on this and you'll see here at the bottom, you'll see a tab and it's called same series. So here, open this and you'll see all of the assets that were shot within that same shoot. So you can see here your main model in the center is scattered throughout these other assets. Um, so what's great is that maybe one asset will be, you know, for um, a spot on YouTube, another one will be for a spot on um, Instagram, and you want to mix it up. So um, that's really excellent, uh, an excellent tip. And okay, so now I'll go back to my board. And um, so why don't you, let me scroll through this. Is there, um, an asset that you like. Uh, those are the three terms, the three tips I wanted to show you. So the Boolean, using the term not, um, keywords, and then how to find a same series within that asset. So is there one here that you like that you think could potentially work for a millennial going back to the workplace? Absolutely. Also the girl with the coffee on her desk, very relatable. I feel like that's also mm. one of those things that everyone looks for, the, the ways that, you know, kind of tie us all together. So this was fantastic. I also don't, I don't think I've ever used a board. So this makes me happy. It's like my own little Getty Images Pinterest. I'm, I love it. Thank you so much. You know, yeah, it really is. And you can even add notes here um, for your colleagues just on this little blurb here. So you can share it amongst your team. Um, well, thank you for, um, you know, being my, my pretend client. Um, <laughs> yeah, I will be using these clips. So when you see them in brand videos, don't be surprised because this was fantastic. And it's so helpful. I've never used the term not. So I know a lot of times we have that issue where it's, this would be great, but we don't want them looking at camera. So I'm gonna be using that a lot. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Um, okay, Rachel, back to you. Thank you so much, Daniel and Blair. That was great. So, so far we've learnt what goes into making an impactful brand video. We've found out how Getty Images delivers industry leading video content. And we've seen how easy it is to find the perfect clip on gettyimages.com. But how do you know which visuals are gonna connect with your audience? Well, we've done this research for you, so you don't have to. Visual GPS is next. Where do you turn? when there's goals to meet, impressions to be made, a message to get across, and the perfect image, video, or illustration will make all the difference. Introducing Getty Images Visual GPS, the next generation of industry-disrupting visual research. Building on our 25 years of experience, it's a guide to what consumers care about and how to choose the visuals that connect with them. It's not just another trends report. It's the art of choosing visual content matched with the science of consumer behavior, leveraging sales and search data, insights from our visual experts, and the latest market research, giving you a glimpse of today's consumer, what drives their decision-making, and what's engaging to them. Whoever your audience, wherever they are, Visual GPS helps you drive your message right to them. And that perfect image, video or illustration, you'll know it when you see it.
Our visual GPS research found that consumers want to see diverse and inclusive imagery all year round. That's why we partnered with GLAAD to create a set of guidelines to better represent the LGBTQ plus community. To introduce those guidelines, please welcome Rebecca Rom Frank from our Creative Insights team. Hi, thank you so much, Rachel. So yes, I sit on the Creative Insights team at Getty Images. Um, and our team created Visual GPS uh, with a market research firm um, so that we can understand what visuals will resonate with the end consumer. Um, now, our Creative Insights team is a pretty unique asset that Getty Images has. I've heard our team described as a secret weapon because it's our job to identify shifts in the landscape of visual storytelling so that we can then advise our customers about what, which visuals will drive engagement for them. So just a Quick background, um, we look at our internal data, we're looking at customer downloads and searches, uh, and also external data, such as what's going on in pop culture, um, film and television, uh, other consumer research. Um, we are multidisciplinary, we come from many different backgrounds, and we're global too. We have uh, researchers based um, in here in New York, London, Tokyo, uh, and other locations as well. So for our most recent wave of visual GPS research, we wanted to understand the consumer experience and how they perceive LGBTQ plus representation in the media. And it was this research that led to the creation of the LGBTQ plus guidelines. So from drag race to, to queer eye, there's never been a time in mainstream pop culture that the LGBTQ plus community and their stories have been this front and center. So but when we surveyed consumers, both LGBTQ plus consumers and um, people that don't identify as being part of that community, uh, we found that despite the popularity of these stories in the media, representation of this community across the entire visual landscape, including media and advertising, is actually pretty low. So only about one in five consumers report seeing LGBTQ plus uh, people represented regularly. And uh, much of that is from social media platforms too. So even less through branding and, and advertisements. But when we're thinking about you know, how to correct this, we, we, we're seeing that representation alone is not the only thing to address because when we do see the LGBTQ plus community in media and advertising, they tend to be shown in kind of stereotypical ways. So some of the most common stereotypes consumers reported seeing were gay men shown as feminine or flamboyant, lesbian women as masculine or visuals that involve symbolism such as rainbow flags or a pride march. And so there's nothing inherently wrong with each of these representations in isolation. Um, these are all things that are part of the LGBTQ plus community after all, but these images are, are overrepresented and therefore can, can seem cliche. And part of the problem with using cliches to represent this community is that um, inevitably, by simplifying the narrative, they tend to leave out members of the queer community. So consumers told us that they see transgender people represented the least. And in fact, they recalled seeing transgender people excuse me, portrayed primarily as victims of violence more than any other type of scenario, which is harmful and dehumanizing because what that means is that they are much less frequently seen in humanizing scenarios such as work, everyday life, in a position of power, et cetera. So that means they are not being given the depth of storytelling that we see for other groups. So think about what um, Blair and, and our art directors were just saying, how it's really important to show this, you know, real, real people doing relatable things in visuals and uh, video. Um, it's really important that LGBTQ plus people are represented in this way as well. And a big part of adding this, this dimension to visual storytelling around the LGBTQ plus community is avoiding tokenism and showing intersectionality in visual representations because not all LGBTQ plus people have the same identity or the same lived experience. So through our visual GPS surveys, 
LGBTQ plus consumers told us that they are the group most likely to experience multiple biases out in the world. So if they experience bias with regard to their gender identity or sexual orientation, they are more likely to experience bias with regards to other aspects of their identity, such as race and ethnicity, body size or type or disability, for example. And I'll get more into intersectionality later on as well. All of this visual GPS research compounded with our own observations about pop culture and um, Getty Images customer behaviors have led us to conclude that a change is needed and action must be taken to drive that change. Our team is made up of members of the LGBTQ plus community as well as allies. So we deeply understand the importance of inclusive, authentic visual storytelling. And at Getty Images, our work around diverse and inclusive content has always been uh, ongoing. This is this is work that we've been doing for a long time. Um, and we really believe that the right visuals are a powerful tool that can really drive change. And in fact, our re research found that there is a correlation between the frequency by which LGBTQ plus people are represented in the media and cultural acceptance in the real world. Um, so we know that the time is right to, to really uh, take a step forward in this regard. We are thrilled to have GLAD's expertise. Uh, they have been conducting their own research and a study that they did with P&G found that uh, the real barrier to seeing more LGBTQ plus representation in advertising seems to be less that American culture is not accepting and more that brands are actually afraid of getting it wrong. So 81% of advertisers and 41% of agencies worry that an inauthentic depiction of LGBTQ plus people in scenarios would lead to a larger backlash than not featuring them in advertising at all. Even though they also found 68% of non-LGBTQ plus consumers say they actually feel better about buying from companies that feature this community in their ads. So even with the best intentions, brands are sometimes unsure of where to start. And that's why we developed this guide to provide clear guidance to brands, agency, and agencies and, and all creatives. Um, in their aims to bring the LGBTQ plus community to the center of marketing and advertising inclusively and authentically. So now I am going to give you a taste of what the guidebook looks like. Um, after this presentation, we will send around a link so that you can access it yourself. But in the meantime, I will walk you through what it looks like. The guidebook will cover three key areas. And the first is starting with a basic understanding of the LGBTQ plus community to clearly define who is included under this umbrella of acronyms and bring attention to the broad visual stereotypes that often occur. We really want this topic to be accessible to everyone, whether they're part of the LGBTQ plus community or not. So just a quick word about the acronym LGBTQ plus, which I've been saying a lot during this presentation. Um, it stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. And the plus is added to indicate awareness that there are many other terms people may use to describe their sexual orientation and gender identity. So that includes pansexual, asexual, non-binary, genderqueer, questioning, and more. Um, and we go into more detail in the guidebook around this as well. And then in each section, we also cover questions that you should consider as you're making your visual choices. So in, for example, looking at things like the scenarios that LGBTQ plus people appear in, consider what messages you might maybe conveying by the virtue of their roles. Are, are you showing them in these everyday relatable scenarios, um, you know, that we've established are, are so that, the, excuse me, that we've established really connect with consumers. Um, some other questions that we ask are, you know, are you showing this community having fun, traveling maybe with their community or outside of it? Uh, LGBTQ plus people have friends who may not be part of that community. Um, and that's an important thing to show. And it's really important to consider all aspects of the lived experience uh, to depict this community authentically. 
Um, another crucial section we dive into for brands is the importance of looking at gender identity as separate from sexual orientation. We want to make sure we're continuously centering trans and gender non-conforming people and humanizing their visual depictions. So we looked at unpacking what gender identity means within the LGBTQ plus community broadly, and then specifically focused on the trans community because we know that is an important demographic to represent with care. And one key barrier to that is that many people confuse and conflate biological sex, gender identity, and gender expression. So to understand the multi-layered concept of gender, we take a look at all three separately so that it, it's very clear. Biological sex is has to do with the physical body created by very technical chromosomes, genes, hormones, basically what the doctor writes on your birth certificate. Gender identity refers to the internal sense of self by which you know your gender. You know, that can be usually the categories are man, woman, or non-binary, if you feel that you don't fit into those categories. And then gender expression are the external cues that we use to communicate gender. So things such as your name, your pronouns, your hair length, or your clothing. Um, those are all things that people use to express themselves and, and show their identity. Remember, gender expression is separate uh, from gender identity. And, and remember that some people have a gender expression that doesn't conform to a conventional expectation of masculinity or femininity. Um, and there's a lot more on this topic in the guidelines as well, as I mentioned. And then um, going into talking about trans identity, you know, it's one thing to show the trans community, but um, some of the questions that we have are asking, you know, are you focused on aspects of transgender people beyond the fact that they are transgender? It's really important to not just kind of tokenize people in order to check a box. In order to really represent transgender people authentically, it's important to highlight uh, their personalities. So, you know, you can ask yourself, are you showing their hobbies and interests? Um, again, it's about this depth of storytelling and not relying on tokenism to represent this community. And then last, but certainly not least, um, the importance of intersectionality. So as creators and providers and selectors of visual content, we need to be conscious of the ways that um, this shows up, not just in our society, but in our choices visually. So intersectionality also highlights where certain groups are left out or even discriminated against, despite the drive towards more inclusive visual stories. It's really important to move beyond a depiction of the LGBTQ plus community Community as overwhelmingly young, white, male, cisgender, thin, or without disabilities. Um, unfortunately, these te do tend to be the dominant stories that we see um, when it comes to visual storytelling. So any LGBTQ plus storytelling must also center stories of Black, Indigenous, and other people of color especially, um, but also older individuals, people with disabilities, and, and people with bodies of all sizes. Um, because we know that without them, there is no LGBTQ plus community. So just switching into another taste of our sample questions, uh, we ask if you're remembering to include LGBTQ plus people of color of all backgrounds, ethnicities, skin tones, hair types, and textures, um, and older LGBTQ plus people, it's crucial that we recognize that um, this demographic is here and all ages and body types and interests and backgrounds um, are really are important to include in visual storytelling about this group. So as I mentioned, um, we will send around a link um, where you can view the guidelines themselves. This has just been a sampling of the guidelines um, and all of these topics we explore in much more depth. And you can also check out visualgps.com for more on our research study. And you can also check out creativeinsights.gettyimages.com um, for more writing on trends in visual storytelling about this topic and many others. So we believe that there is a huge opportunity to upend stereotypes and tell stories that have not been told before. And while we know that you know, we won't reverse harmful stereotypes overnight. We know that together we can create impact with inclusivity and empathy. So we hope you'll join us. Thanks and back to you, Rachel. Thank you, Rebecca, for that amazing presentation. So we have a few minutes left and lots of questions have come in over the show. Um, so let's go to some Q&A. 
So first question we have is uh, one around license model. I see both royalty-free and rights-ready on gettimages.com. What's the difference? I'm going to throw that one to Alwyn. Thanks, Rachel. That's a great question. Um, Rights Ready is a limited license, so it works on a per project basis. And the fee for that uh, license depends on the industry, the media, the geographic distribution and the time. A TV commercial that's say worldwide for three months is obviously going to cost more than a social media post that's going to be um, live just a week. Now, royalty free is a perpetual license, which means it has no end date. You can use that asset, be it still or video, as many times as you like in multiple projects, any media worldwide. So really, really flexible. Amazing. Thank you, Alwyn. Next up is a question for Blair. Given the past year, what changes have you seen in what your clients are asking for when it comes to brand videos? The biggest request is reflection on currently what's happening. They, um, they want footage that reflects what is happening within kind of either where their main customer is or where they are. They want something that looks like today. Before, I think they wanted something that was more evergreen. I'm, we're seeing a lot more uh, focus on what today and what our current landscape looks like. So that would be the biggest request that we're getting. Awesome. Um, a question on our visual GPS research. So it's great that you develop guidelines for choosing visuals that are inclusive of, inclusive of the LGBTQ plus community, but do you have the content available? Question for Rebecca. A fair question. So short answer is yes. Um, we created guidelines for our customers for choosing visuals, but we've also created guidelines uh, to help our contributors and our media creators shoot content featuring LGBT, the LGBTQ plus community as well. So about over the past year or so, um, they've been hard at work shooting content that is really uh, unique and authentic um, and really, um, you know, really showcases all of these things that I've been talking about um, with the LGBTQ plus guidebook. Um, so if you go to the link that we've sent um, that shows the guidebook and you scroll all the way down to the bottom of the landing page, you can click and see a board of some of the best content that has come in. Um, and it's really amazing and impressive. Um, definitely check it out. Thank you, Rebecca. Well, that's just about it for today's show. A huge thank you to our experts, Alan Gosford, Amy Lefeld, Rebecca Romfrank, Daniel Montoya, and our special guest, Blair Bercy. Answers to any questions we didn't get to will be posted on the Getty Images blog later this week, along with any additional resources. When you log out today, a survey pop-up will appear and we'd be really appreciative if you could fill it out and let us know what you thought of today's show. If you have any other additional questions or suggestions for topics for future episodes, you can email us at thedownload at gettyimages.com. And join us next month when we take a look at the Olympics and learn how we go from camera to customer in under one minute, even during a pandemic. You're not gonna wanna miss this one. Registration opens soon. Until then, I've been your host, Rachel Brinton-Matthews. We'll see you then. <laughs>